And um, Shark Fit is a sustainable shark safety and research organization based in Cape Town, Falls Bay. Um, so last week, Shannon touched on the perception of people on sharks, shark attacks or shark bites as we prefer to call them. And today I'm going to go into a bit more detail about shark bite safety, the different approaches used in different areas around the world um, and how we can move towards more sustainable ways for people and sharks to coexist. So sharks have been around for millions of years and inhabit all oceans on, the, on Earth. So sometimes people forget that every time they enter the ocean, they enter a wild ecosystem and that sharks are apex predators and an important part of the ocean environment. And when we enter the ocean, um, there is a great chance that we can encounter them. So it's the same as stepping out of your car in a national park like the Kruger. So however, just because we enter space that we shared with sharks, it doesn't mean that we will get bitten by one. In fact, shark attacks are actually quite dead. So there are over 500 different species of sharks in the world, and there are only three of them that are seen as a potential threat to people and are responsible for majority of unprovoked shark attacks. These are great white sharks, the tiger sharks, and bull sharks. The maps on the screen shows the distribution of these sharks species around the oceans in the world and you will notice that the sharks the green the green shaded areas indicate the areas where the sharks are found and you will notice that the sharks all inhabit coastal areas um, which is also where people tend to be so and this overlap between people and sharks close to shore is where we tend to have shark bites occur So over the last 50 years, we have seen a significant increase in the number of shark bites taking place around the world. This is indicated by the red line on the map, on the graph. Um, and in fact, we know the reason for this um, increase is not because shark populations are increasing. Um, the opposite is true. Shark populations have decreased dramatically due to overfishing and other threats. Um, and instead, the reason for the increase in the rate of shark bites is due to the increase in the human population over the years, which is indicated by the blue line on the graph. Um, and this has led to more people living and holidaying on the coast and spending more time in our oceans. With more people spending more time in our oceans, the probability of encountering sharks has increased, and therefore, so has the number of shark bites. Even though we have seen an increase in the rate of shark bite incidents over the last 50 years, this does not mean that they are common events. In the last five years, there has been an average of only 82 unprovoked attacks um, worldwide. And sharks are only responsible for about six fatalities per year. To put this into perspective, there are a number of more common ways um, that people can die. And something that we not think of as scary as shark bites. So like coconuts, which are responsible for 150 deaths annually. Cows, which are responsible for 20 people annually. And then also um, champagne corks are responsible for 24 deaths annually. And the thing we should fear the most is drowning, and it's not something that we often think of. And in fact, um, the World Health Organization estimates that there is an average of 320,000 deaths by drowning every year. Um, but we are not scared of this when coming to the beach. So why do we fear sharks that much? And this is a result of the perception of people on sharks. So shark, shark bites get a lot of media attention and despite the very low probability of encountering a shark in the ocean, the fear of a shark bite is very real and shark bite incidents cause a lot of trauma to individuals and communities. And this is not helped by the media reports that exaggerate and distort shark bite events and feed into the public panic and hysteria amongst them. So although shark bites are there, there is no doubt that shark bites can um, have dramatic effects on communities and individuals. And therefore governments around the world have been under pressure and are looking at ways to mitigate or reduce these impacts um, to protect new communities. Historically, shark bite mitigation has involved lethal control of sharks. Um, this includes killing sharks in an area to reduce shark population and therefore reduce the risk of encountering a shark. This is done through 
shark hunts, short term cows. This is where boats, fishermen just go out and catch sharks and kill them after a shark attack has happened. Or long term shark culls. Um, these include your gill nets, um, where it's a long term culling of sharks. Um, and alongside this, some countries have chosen to ban all recreational um, water activities like swimming and surfing with permanent beach, beach closes. Um, so we call these flows in logic um, because they are often knee jerk reactions that are not sustainable or have very serious environmental impacts. Um, yeah, you can see these um, show the two main ways that shark culls are implemented. It's either through gill nets that float in the water off a beach and trap and kill sharks, or by drum lines, which is the orange balls you can see on the side there, uh, which has baited hooks fit close to beaches to catch sharks, um, which are then killed if they are deemed to be potentially dangerous. It is important to note that these shark nets do not stop sharks from entering a beached area. They are not barriers and sharks can still swim around them and underneath them. These lethal control methods can potentially kill large numbers of shark species. And there's no strong scientific evidence to show that killing sharks actually reduces the risk of sharks bites in an area. This is because many sharks are migratory, moving long distances. And so if you kill one shark in an area, another one could soon be off the anchor. Another problem is that shark nets and drum lines are not selective. They indiscriminately catch any large marine animals, many of whom are threatened or endangered and therefore are extremely bad for the environment and can have very negative impacts on the marine ecosystem. So here you can see that I think that is a, a blue shark with pressure shark that has been caught in the net and that shark is not deemed as potentially dangerous or a threat to people. You can see there's a sunfish that has been caught and tangled in the net a dolphin as well as a turtle. And every year, many whales get tangled and down in shark nets along the South African as well as Australian coastline. So while lethal control methods have been used by governments around the world since the 1930s, we are thankfully starting to see global movement towards more sustainable solutions. So people's perceptions of sharks are changing as they start to understand the important role sharks play in the ecosystem. And this has led to a global outcry from communities to move towards more non-lethal ways to mitigate shark bite incidents. The old adage that the only good shark is a dead shark has now changed and communities have been protesting on behalf of sharks in areas where shark culling has been taking place for decades. So you have heard over the past couple of weeks, if you have been present, um, in the webinars that healthy oceans need sharks. And we also know that people love to swim and surf in the ocean. So if sharks and people are both going to share space in the ocean, we need to find ways that we can coexist with sharks. So non-lethal sustainable shark safety strategies look for ways to find a balance between recreational water user safety and shark conservation. So sustainable shark bite mitigation messages. So how do we do that? What non-lethal measures are there to prevent shark bite? So sustainable shark safety strategies are essentially split into two types. Sorry. Um, Beach-wide safety measures, ones that provide beach-wide safety, either focusing on detecting sharks or deterring sharks from a, a whole beach or an area. And then um, those that are designed for individual beach personal shark protection measures, deterrence. Um, so I'm going to tell you some of the different non-lethal measures to use and uh, that are being tested around the world at the moment. So looking at beach strategies, focusing on detection, um, I'm going to start a little bit closer to home with our organization Shark Spotters. Um, in Cape Town, we have Shark Spotters, the organization that I work for. Our safety service provides an early warning system that alerts water users to the presence of large sharks close to shore. We use continuous visual surveillance, spotting from the mountain to detect sharks and then implement temporary beach closes if the sharks um, pose a potential threat, thereby reducing the spatial overlap between people and sharks. We also communicate with the public. Um, around shark activity and the shark safety so that they can know the risk when entering the water. 
The program has been operating successfully since 2004 and has recorded over 2,500 white shark sightings in that time, significantly, significantly improving beach safety in Cape Town. However, there are some, some, some limitations, including the need for mountains or similar elevation close to the sea, the impact of weather conditions on spotting ability, as well as the potential for human error. So no um, beach detection system is 100% um, risk-free. The program is also unique because of its holistic approach. It combines shark safety with research as well as education to ensure that people are armed with the latest shark safety information so that they can make informed decisions around shark risk before entering the water. Beach detection and aerial patrols. So similar to the spotting program we have in Cape Town, where we use people, many uh, areas around the world in Australia use both aerial patrols to detect sharks. These have been done for over 30 years and have strong public support. Unfortunately though, the detection rates of aerial patrols are very low, with recent studies showing um, that they can only potentially spot between 13 and 18 percent of sharks in an area. On top of this, they are only over a beach for a short period of time, less than five minutes, and do not offer protection once they have moved to the next area. The Australian government has published several, several reports explaining these limitations to the public and explaining that it is not very effective for shark safety strategy, but for some reason the public still feels safer with aerial patrols and therefore they can continue to be used all over South um, Australia. Sorry. In recent years, they've also started to use drones to detect sharks. These are better detection rates that fixed wing planes and helicopters have, but also come with a number of limitations, such as battery life, weather issues, legislation around flying them. Um, they are promising development that will hopefully be able to enhance beach safety in some areas in future. So another, one, another beach detection system is the sonar system. So this is similar to fish finders that fishermen use. So sonar bounces sound waves into the ocean and reflect off objects and then feeds back an image of the shape of the object. So Clever Boy, an Australian-based company, has been developing a system with a, straw, with a string of sonar buoys across a beach that will detect any sharks that come past. They have trialed it at a few beaches on the east and west coast of Australia um, with mixed results. The beach is a very dynamic place with lots of ambient noise from crashing waves that make it difficult to have sown very close to shore. It is also difficult to distinguish between shark species with the current system that they have. So hopefully as technology develops and improves, this will also become an effective and commercially available shark detection system. So another beach deterrent is the exclusion barriers. So another form of non-lethal shark bite mitigation that cover a whole beach area in many places around the world of many places around the world are implementing this deterrent system. These prevent animals from entering a specific area, usually forming some sort of barrier. These are different from lethal shark nets, also called gill nets, that catch and kill sharks and other animals. The traditional shark exclusion barriers are used around the world in areas such as Hong Kong, Australia, and the Seychelles. They form a complete barrier from the sea floor to the sea surface. Um, basically forming a fence that stops sharks from entering a swimming zone. If they are properly maintained, these are an effective shark safety strategy. However, they are susceptible to damage from bad weather and strong sea conditions. And so are also really good for calm and sheltered areas. Also, they only cover a small area, so only provide safety for swimmers and not servers. As you can hear, a lot of them have limitations to areas. So in Fishhook, again, bringing it a bit closer to home, Shark Spotters has what we call a Fishhook Sharks Exclusion Barrier. It has a unique design, um, and it's completely unique to any other um, shark barrier used in any other parts of the world. Um, this barrier can de be deployed and retrieved on a daily basis, um, and it is being designed like this to minimize the damage caused by strong wind and swell. Um, and if the conditions are unsuitable, the net is not deployed. Um, 
This has meant that we can put it in an area with strong winds and sea conditions, and that is extremely cost effective as the maintenance expenses on it are very low. Another beachy deterrent would be the electronic repellent cable. The sharks put in Kozilla Natal are trying to reduce the environmental impact that their current shark nets and drum lines have. So for a number of years, they've been developing an electronic repellent to work as a deterrent on beaches. They have successfully developed it for personal use, but for beach wide use, they have a shark repellent cable which emits electrical pulses and sharks have what we call ampullae of Lorenzini, which is little um, uh, spots on their noses that allow them to detect electrical current, um, which is they use in nature to detect fish. The idea with the electronic repellent cable um, is that as a shark approaches the cable, it will disrupt the ampullae of Lorenzini. Um, and it is said to be so similar to having a bright light shine in your eyes. Um, it will make you cringe. It doesn't hurt, um, but it will obviously make you cringe. So when approaching this um, electronic repellent cable, the sharks will more, most likely move away and it acts like a barrier, but without being a solid fence itself. And it works with the basis of electronic currents that run through it. It is safe for humans. The current is not very strong, so it dissipates very quickly, but because sharks can detect, detect very low currents, it might be effective. This is still under development and is not yet at the stage um, that it has been put on any beaches, so it's still being tested. And they've been busy for a number of years, but hopefully in the near future, this can potentially be a great um, thing that replaces the shark nets and drum line. So the final beach-wide solution that I would like to share with you is the shark safe barrier. This acts as a deterrent as it mimics a kelp forest as seen along the South African coastline, and it is so believed that sharks do not enter the kelp forest. It is also filled with magnets, which is in the same way as the electronic cable, the magnets affect the ampullae of Lorenzini. The idea of this battery is that it will deter sharks as a visual deterrent, so if they see the cables looking like a kelp forest, they won't go near it. And then also, the um, ampullae of Lorenzini will be affected. So like, again, bright light signing in the eyes make them cringe, but it will be affecting the ampullae of Lorenzini. This is also still in development. And they've done a few trials that have shown some success in the Western Cape, in Hansby. And they have also been trialing it in the Julian Island um, since 2019. Um, and they have not had sharks yet in the area, but they at least said that um, it is able to withstand the weather conditions as it's been in the waters um, in the time of this. So um, hopefully in the future, this would be um, used as a beach-wide safety solution. So moving on to personal shark deterrent devices. So technologies that individuals can use to reduce their own risk of encountering a shark. Um, for use at a beach where there maybe isn't um, existing shark safety measures in place. So you will see here the latest shark repellent technology, the wooden spoon. It's proven to be as ex effective as any other untested repellent on the market. With beach-wide safety solution that is obviously put in by governments, a lot of rigorous scientific testing goes into seeing if they are effective because it is costly. But in the world of personal shark um, protection, this is not necessarily the case. And there are an awful lot of different solutions that have been marketed to people to keep them safe from sharks. And in the reality is a lot of them has not been tested. So we have no idea if they are effective or if they have same, the same effect of the wooden spoon. So I'm going to run through a couple of um, personal shark protecting devices and share with you a study that has been done. So concerns about shark attacks has obviously led to the development of a range of personal shark deterrent technology. Many of these technologies are still in development and a very few have undergone independent testing of the effectiveness in deterring sharks under different conditions. So the public has very little information when deciding on which personal deterrent to use. So personal deterrents use a range of different methods to deter sharks, and this includes electrical current, um, magnetic fields. So you can see the, the, 
the, the turquoise color, um, those are magnetic bands and things like that. The shark shield is also magnetic and electrical currents. And then also we have um, visual cues, which is you can see the stripy wetsuit in, in the picture there, and also the camouflage wetsuits um, at the bottom. And then also olfactory stimulants um, have been used. Um, the, the chili wax and the shark spray up top there. Um, it is very good to know in the world where it is very hard, sorry, it is very hard to know in this world where we have very good Facebook marketing, um, things will sell and it is ha or very hard to know um, exactly what is effect. So a study was conducted um, on, the fi on five um, personal shark bite deterrents, which is very popular. Um, so in Australia, a group of scientists decided to do a proper controlled scientific experiment to look into some of the most popular items on the market to see how they effective they were. Um, these are the products I will list them that were tested and um, we will see if they were effective. So the first product there is the R Pella. It's a unit that is mounted onto the underside of the surfboard. And it is designed to over, overwhelm the shark's electronic receptors, the ampullae of Lorenzini. And then we have the Freedom Plus Surf, which is an antenna sticker um, that creates an electrical field around the board, designed to over, also overwhelm the shark's electronic receptors. Um, it's attached to the tail pad, uh, it, and it's a, st a sticker that is applied to the surfboard and to the underside of the surfboard. And then we have the shark bands bracelet. Um, it contains permanent magnets, which are designed to overwhelm the electronic magnetic sense of the sharks. And it's worn around your ankle or your wrist. And then we have the shark band surf leash. The surf leash contains permanent magnets as well. And it's designed also to overwhelm the electronic magnetic sense of sharks. And then we have the last one, the chili wax. It's a combination of eucalyptus, chili, cloves, kind, pepper, and a bunch of other things. Um, and the odor, the, the purpose of this is the odor will overwhelm the shark's olfactory organs and then deter them away. So you will apply this to your surfboard. So using custom built surfboards with the deterrents and bait attached to, the, to them, the team of scientists conducted 297 trials to compare changes in shark behavior when each deterrent was active. So including the amount of times the bait was taken, the distance to the, to the bait, the number of passes, or where the shark reaction what could be observed. Um, so here is the results from the study that compared the effectiveness of these personal shark deterrents. The main findings of the study was that only one device, so the r -Pella, did not show any significant um, effect on the shark behavior. Chili wax, the magnetic band, the magnetic shield leash, um, only the Freedom Surf Plus um, was shown to have significant effect on the shark behavior. All four other deterrents were shown to have limited to no measurable effect on shark behavior. So only the one deterrent, the Freedom Plus, um, band um, it, uh, was shown to be effective in reducing the uterus. The bait was taken 40%, the bait was still taken for 40% of the time, but this still cannot guarantee 100% that you will not encounter a shock. But 60% of the time, the bait was not taken. So if you want to invest in a personal shark seal, do so, but only buy one that has peer reviewed scientific evidence of effectiveness. And if there's a device, um, that is shown to reduce the risk of a shark sanction significantly, it is worthwhile to invest, especially in high risk areas where there are no other safety measures in place. So as you have seen, there are a number of different non-lethal sustainable shark safety solutions. However, we have to remember there is no silver bullet solution to ensure 100% safety, um, whether using personal shark deterrents or with the presence of beach white safety measures. For individuals who choose to enter the water, there is always a risk, even when lethal control measures are in place. We are looking at ways on how to stop shark attacks without killing sharks, as we understand the importance. So continuous research into understanding sharks and their behavior is important. 
as well as continuous research into finding non-lethal solutions, as no one shark safety measure can work everywhere. To remove the risk completely is to swim in an area that completely um, excludes sharks from an area um, where there's a barrier, or to stay out of the water altogether. For those of us who choose to venture out further into the ocean, the best thing you can do is to be hashtag shark smart. So learn the warning signs and safety tips that will reduce your chance of encountering our shark, as our safety is our responsibility after all. This is why education is such an important part of any shark safety program and is being implemented in shark bite hotspots around the world. As you can see in these graphics um, from South Africa, Australia, as well as the USA, um, they all essentially say the same thing. They are telling you to surf and swim in groups, swim between the flags, don't swim alone, um, avoid areas where dolphins and fish are swimming um, and all those things they're sharing. It's important to follow these um, safety advice and tips. Um, and thank you. That is the end of my presentation. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And for more information, you can visit um, sharkspotters.org.za. And if you have any questions, you can email me on my email address on this. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Nicole. That was very informative. Uh, our chat is booming with, with questions. Uh, you see, I've sent you some, so you can tackle some of those questions. We can, we have some time for maybe two or three questions. Uh, okay. Anyone in the floor still has questions? You can pop them in your chat. Okay, so um, one of the questions, sorry, I have my cell phone in my hand, but it's because the questions are on my cell phone. Um, have exclusion device, devices ever killed any sharks? So I will focus specifically on our um, um, shark exclusion barrier as because that is what I know most of. Um, and I can also then send in an email um, additional answers to that specific question. So our exclusion net in Fishhook has never killed any sharks, any animals, anything. So what makes that net so unique is that um, the net is deployed every morning and taken out every evening, thus reducing the impact on the marine environment. So when no one is around to see anything, um, the net will not be in. So what happens is when the net is in and a shark enters the area, or um, we still remove the people out of the net, but we have never seen the shark swimming into the net, bumping into it, they always just move past the net. Um, and swim calmly away from it and also when we do have whales and dolphins or anything come close to the net we can go in with our boat we can lift the net up and we can remove it or we can also just deploy our boat to deter the animals away from the net that is uh, the method that we use so nothing has ever been caught or trapped in our shark exclusion bag and then so how does the fish hook shark exclusion net work is another one of the questions um so like i explained the net is um deployed on a daily basis only during season so during winter months we won't deploy the net because it is weather dependent so if the um we deploy it in the more during spring and summer so from september until the end of april we deploy the net the net goes in in the morning and out in the evening and it's weather dependent so if the seas are unstable um or if there's if it's too much rain or there's too much wind, we will not put the net in. And obviously we will um, alert the public that the net will not be deployed. Um, um, Nicole? And basically, uh, yes. Oh yeah, I was just saying, it's a follow-up question to that. So uh, that uh, this fish hook net is used with uh, shark spotters. Yes, so it's unique and only shark spotters use it. We only have it in fish hook in False Bay. Okay, so there was a question, when do you think sharks will be in a position to deploy the electronic repellent cable rather than the awful gill net? I am not 100% sure um, about that. Um, they are still testing and um, they are doing, so at the moment during lockdown, obviously the nets were removed during the lockdown period. Um, so hopefully that has be, um, been positive um, for the marine environment on that side. Um, but I'm not 100% sure about that. I can maybe um, find out for you and then also add this to the Q&A 
which I will sing soon after the webinar. Um, so here's another question. Does the deterrence exclusion, exclusion barriers keep the sharks away by chemicals or just as a physical bar barrier? So the exclusion barrier is basically just what it says. It's a barrier. Um, it does not keep the sharks away from the area. So sharks will still visit the area even if the net is in. Um, but it excludes um, sharks or any other animals from entering what we call the exclusion zone. So when the net is in, nothing can get in to the exclusion zone so that we surface or uh, not surface where swimmers are swimming so nothing can get into that specific area so here's a question do we need the shark spotters if they have if we have the net so um yes we do need the shark spotters if we have the net because the net is only um, present at one beach in Fishuk. Um, the other beaches, we are st we're still doing lots of research and doing things like that. Um, but the net is not able to go along a longer stretch of beach. So I'm going to use Musenberg as an example. The stretch of beach is long, longer. And in Fishuk, where we have, if you saw in the picture, let me just go back there quickly. The exclusion net, as you can see in the picture in the corner there, it's in the, the exclusion net is in a corner. Um, so trying to put that over a long stretch of beach might be a bit more difficult. Um, so it won't be as effective. And the reason why we still need shark spotters is because shark spotters don't just operate in Fishhook. They also operate on other beaches, um, six other alternative beaches in the Cape Town area, which is obviously now the alternative method to having the shark exclusion ban. Think, is there any more questions? Um, I do not have any questions from the chat right now. Um, so I think everyone is satisfied. Uh, so with that, thank you very much, Nicole. That was very informative and uh, I, I've learned a lot. And I think uh, our uh, crowd, uh, our uh, group here has learned a lot as well. And there are things which we can use in our daily lives to improve our understanding of the sharks uh, and the ocean as a whole. So thank you for that. And to everyone, thank you for attending. Uh, it's always nice to have you here. So um, yeah, I think that's about it. I don't see any more questions. So with that, uh, until next week, and uh, we have uh, we'll post this video up tomorrow and uh, we also see if there's any questions we missed and we post those up tomorrow so thank you very much thank you very much